Fantastic. All right. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. I hope to find everyone well. I know this is the time of year where uh, burnout meets freezing temperatures. So thank you all for being here. My name is Lauren Burroughs. I use pronouns uh, she, her, and I work at uh, the Center for Student Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, today I'm calling in from the traditional territory of the neutral Atawandron, uh, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe people, and I'm currently occupying the Haldeman Tract. Uh, this is land and that was promised uh, through treaty to six nations, which less than 5% remains with them today. For this section of the webinar, we're gonna be talking about supporting racially and culturally diverse LGBTQ2S plus student experiences. Uh, so I'm just gonna start uh, with uh, some expectations and limitations. Uh, obviously, this is sort of a high level conversation. Uh, not a lot can be accomplished in 15 minutes. Uh, also, this is based off of uh, a lot of experiential knowledge as uh, things um, that myself and colleagues that I work with uh, have been thinking through as those who work with communities who identify uh, within these groups and also as folks who have lived experience for my humanity. Yeah, so some of the things, high level expectations, uh, just some of the things my colleagues and I are working through. Um, also, uh, if you wanted to review um, additional documents, there are a lot of really easy accessible, easily accessible documents that are not behind any paywalls. Um, and so uh, organizations like Campus Pride and the Gay, Lesbian and Straight Education Network have put out information that's great to look at. Uh, for those of you folks who have access to academic journals, I would really suggest working through um, uh, those resources that you have accessible to you and then also sharing those with your community partners. Uh, the next piece that I brought up was this idea about avoiding Columbusing. Uh, so uh, Tima Okun and Kenneth Jones in the Dismantling Racism Workbook uh, speak to a phenomenon called Columbusing, where in white dominant cultural spaces we claim things are innovative and new, uh, but they're actually strategies, knowledges, artifacts that are being used in communities of color for long periods of time and come out of these communities. Um, so it's important for me to note that anything I share is collective knowledge and it's an accumulation of that knowledge from activists, artists, healers, intellectuals, academics, etc. over time. Uh, I'd also like to challenge some of the utility of the language that I'm using uh, in that racially diverse, racialized, culturally diverse, even LGBTQ2S plus uh, conflate a multiplicity of identities. Uh, and so uh, there's a limitation uh, to how useful they are. Uh, uh, they become really important around like movement making. However, uh, we really need to build relationships with individuals and communities that allow for relevant, uh, divergent, and often contradictory knowledges to be understood. Uh, because of this, uh, it's really important to note that I'm not going to speak to a specific identity or experience as there's a lot of dangers around voice appropriation. And so that's when we narrate someone's experience through our own lens, often when we are part of or have a dominant identity. Uh, for example, uh, I would not wish to uh, narrate the experiences of two-spirit communities through the lens of myself as a settler. Um, and so I encourage those who are seeking to address those gaps in their knowledge and want to know specifically about those experiences to take sort of a three-step approach for yourself or your organization. Uh, the first uh, step, as stated by my colleague, Gawanago Bonnie Whitlow, is engaging your own research as much of it as you can. Um, for example, learn about Indigenous histories and, and ongoing resistance movements against colonial violence in the Canadian state. Uh, this number one pre uh, prepares you for further education, specifically uh, about two-spirit communities, for example, uh, but also might mitigate some of the harm that uh, would occur uh, uh, towards or if an educator were to come into the space. Uh, number two, reach out to local Indigenous organizations that provide education. Uh, obviously connect with the folks whose land uh, you're currently occupying if you're a settler. Uh, it's really important for us to disrupt uh, problematic forms of pan-Indigeneity or the interchangeability of Indigenous identities. So uh, connect uh, with those close to you first and then move outwards and then obviously compensate an Indigenous uh, Two-Spirit Educator fairly for their labor. Um, and then finally an accessibility note. I know that we're talking really quickly uh, but I will try and talk to all the text on each of the slides and any of the um, sort of graphics that I have on the slides are purely aesthetic and don't require any verbal captioning because they don't contribute to the content at all. Awesome. So the first thing that becomes important for those of us seeking to provide meaningful support is to look at intrapersonal barriers that impact our engagement and resistance of structural barriers. I would suggest re-engaging in a process of reflexivity or thinking critically about your positionality and engaging in a short interpersonal questionnaire. Uh, the first question to ask is how am I currently engaged with diverse racially and culturally 
um, diverse uh, LGBTQ2S plus issues and experiences. Uh, do an environmental scan of your life and look at where your information is coming from. Uh, do I have friends, families, colleagues for these communities? Do I follow blogs, vlogs, Instagram, content creators? Do I read literature, watch films on connected issues? Do I engage in advocacy or direct labor outside of work? Where are your points of contact? Uh, if you can only map a few opportunities in which you connect in authentic, frequent, and unpaid ways, then it's likely that there are large gaps in your knowledge and that you probably hold some implicit or unconscious bias around these communities. The second question uh, to ask is how I invested time in learning about different forms of cognitive bias that are deeply rooted in racism and, sy and systems of racial capitalism. I would suggest cataloging that bias as best you can. Uh, diversity strategists like Torn Ellis and, and Holly Fawcett state that bias impacts attitudes, behaviors, but most importantly, they impact our decision-making process. So cataloging spaces where we think we might have bias based off of our environmental scan uh, could support us in disrupting it. For example, uh, you may not give a resource to if you're a Muslim student because you have assumptions about conservative cultures that may not even apply to that student, for example. Um, some of the biases that I really, or biases that I'd really like to call attention to are horns and halo. Uh, the first horns is a bias in which you problematize, problematize someone due to one aspect of their identity, experience, or presentation. Uh, this is most evident in those who find uh, uh, culturally or racially diverse LGBTQ2S plus students, uh, especially student activists, as uh, uh, possibly threatening or confrontational, a liability or a drain on institutional resources. If you felt that you've had any of those feelings, uh, there might be um, uh, an oversimplification of those students' identities, right? Uh, the second bias, the halo bias, is also allowing one great thing uh, to cloud your perspective of an individual. Uh, so that might be, for example, valorizing a queer racialized student uh, in, uh, so much so that you feel uncomfortable providing them with uh, meaningful, constructive feedback. And so your response to the racism they, they experience is not to remove structural barriers, but rather put them in a more precarious situation by not providing them with the same necessary feedback, for example, as their white peers. You yeah. have about five minutes left. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, that's amazing. So neither of these obviously allow for the complex realities of these students, nor do they create opportunities for us to make decisions, right, um, that support their agency, dignity, and resiliency. Uh, the final question is how are you contributing? Um, obviously we live in a world of hyper productivity and so how have you given back in tangible ways, whether that's financially um, uh, sending an email, checking in, providing food, etc. And for those of, uh, of you who are interested in um, providing support to an issue that is currently uh, impacting a lot of the students that I'm talking about, uh, you can check out the website that's listed on the page here, http slash slash camp slash supporter toolkit slash um, and you can go there to learn more about the Wasuwet'en nation's resistance against colonial violence uh, that's currently being sanctioned by the state. Right? So uh, one of the most important pieces of supporting um, students is creating by and for spaces. Some of these examples include things like QTPOC Collective, uh, that is a example out of the University of Guelph. Uh, other universities and in institutions have student services clubs, organizations with specific mandates to support racially and cultural communities. Uh, additionally, those also include cultural, culturally specific terminology. Uh, another, uh, sorry, another way to do this is through caucusing. So that means creating separate curated learning spaces for racialized and non-racialized community members. So folks like my colleague Sonia Gallagher, who has experience working in urban farms and other organizational spaces that are engaged in justice-seeking labor that require a lot of interracial and intercultural relationship building have used this strategy. Um, and of course, trainings in communities of practice that privilege experiential knowledge, right? Uh, these spaces become particularly important because they resist acclimatization to white Western dominant spaces. So so students don't have to code switch, manage fragility, or center whiteness. They build community and capacity. They create opportunities to address lateral violence free from the dominant gaze. And they allow for sustainable cross-movement organizing and that you can mitigate some of the harm that might happen when we're engaging in processes of solidarity and mutual aid uh, beforehand uh, and also uh, provide really meaningful educational opportunities. 
there are a lot of barriers to creating spaces by and for. Uh, some of these barriers may include things like student interest. A great way to increase student interest is to increase student leadership in other areas. So request students with experiential knowledge or expertise to sit on uh, other university committees, working groups, and task force. Uh, oftentimes we position uh, student leaders such as the Students Union or the Grad Students Association in those positions uh, and leave out those with uh, intersectional experiences and therefore a lot of knowledge about what it means to experience barriers. Um, source facilitators, educators, counselors that can facilitate by and for spaces and support ways to respond to harm within diverse spaces. Uh, this will be particularly useful if you don't have a, a lot of funding, for example, or someone in house who can create these spaces or support a by and for space. Um, uh, creating these relationships will become particularly meaningful uh, in cases of crisis uh, when it, it might be uh, really important to have by and for spaces for people. Um, Obviously, if you're working with really small populations, um, it might be necessary to create multi-campus, multi-university, cross-sector opportunities to build larger communities. Uh, a lot of uh, folks are doing that work online right now. And then finally, uh, uh, it's really important to do this work uh, sort of in all areas. So building strategic plans in terms of reference that require recognition of cross-movement organizing and the necessity of caucusing allows for spaces that are not focused on diverse LGBTQ2S plus identities to do some of the labor uh, without putting the burden back onto those communities. Okay. The second one is creating networks of culturally specific supports. And I say culturally specific and not responsive or competent or aware because ideally we would want to privilege supports that are from those communities. These include curriculum developers, counselors, educators, student affairs practitioners, chaplains, um, experiential or AAI learning partners and mentors. Um, and so when we do this, we do a couple of things. Number one, we address a lack of representation in employment equity uh, that occur in higher education spaces. We address gaps in student support service provision. We address gaps in racial and cultural literacy, so the ways that we understand and respond to racism. And we provide a stop gap um, when there are disruptions to a culture of learning. Uh, so disruptions to a culture of learning may include things like paternalism or conflict avoidance when we try and resist those things. You have about then, 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll go quick. Connect students with mentors to support a sustainable professionalization pipeline. Um, and so some of the strategies for barriers to creating networks of culturally specific supports are not knowing any of them, uh, obviously. So uh, some of the recommendations are to attend community events with the goal of building relationships before they are needed. Great ways to do that are to look at equity, diversity, and inclusion events on a Facebook Eventbrite or even cold call organizations that you would like to possibly learn more about. Uh, provide a template for practicums, placement, co-ops, external contracts to ensure their policies, procedures, practices, qualifications align with equity, diversity, inclusion priorities, and including uh, um, inclusion for LGBT. Q2S plus folks, but also um, anti-racist um, uh, labor. Uh, ensure off-site supervision is equipped to identify and respond to structural and interpersonal oppression. And so therefore, when we're sending students out, make sure that when the students are, are reporting back to us, that those folks who are on the other side understand what that looks like. And then work towards employment equity and ethical service agreements. Uh, this would be the ideal world for us. And, and if this is not available, we can create a list of resources uh, that we have that we can act in mutual aid with folks uh, that we can offer to external or internal partners uh, I, that are providing folks to our students. I'm um, going to stop sorry. you here. No, don't be sorry. It's fine. It's a it's a challenge. We have so yeah. much. To oh my gosh. I felt like I was running through that. Anyways, in Trulio fashion, I uh, totally um, wrote too much in my PowerPoint. <laughs> but what I'll do is I'll flip to the end here. Uh, I was also going to talk about divesting from celebration and deficit binaries and mitigating hypervisibility and invisibility. Uh, but uh, if you'd like to continue any of the conversations, please feel free to get in touch. Thank you so much, Lauren. I apologize.